There we go. There we go. So um, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you all um, to this um, online talk um, with our guest speaker, Dr. Barbara Douglas, um, entitled Trauma and Bereaved Parents, Am I Going Crazy? So my name, if you don't know me, is Carolyn Bryce, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Compassionate Friends in the UK. It's really wonderful to see so many of you with us in the Zoom room. Um, and also, can I extend a warm welcome to the many others who might watch um, the recording at a future date. So we've been running these online talks and events for some time now, and each of us, each of them has offered us a, a, a wonderful opportunity to listen to speakers who are themselves bereaved parents or siblings and hear their personal perspectives and reflections on loss and grief. So as always, our hope for this afternoon's event is that you may find something in what our speaker, Barbara Douglas, shares with you that perhaps touches your own experience or resonates with you. And perhaps um, her words will offer you some thoughts and ideas that you might find helpful for yourself. But before we start, just a small, few small items of housekeeping um, before we continue on. So as I said, everyone's been muted um, as we've got over 130 now people joining us. Um, please, could we ask you to stay on mute throughout our time together this afternoon? Um, and we also politely ask you to please not use the chat function during Barbara's talk not a great deal if that's possible, um, because it can be really distracting to, um, first of all, our speaker and also to you as the audience, if you feel you have to read things that are being put in the chat. So thank you for that. And also as part of looking after everyone in the Zoom room this afternoon, we also ask um, you to, to refrain from sharing very detailed or graphic descriptions of your loss or your feelings in the chat function. This is really, really important um, this afternoon uh, as this kind of detail or graphic descriptions can be triggering for other people. So thank you really so much for your help with looking after all of us in the Zoom room today. If you have questions for Barbara, then um, please, however, would you ask them in the chat? Um, that's the time where you can use the chat. Um, ideally towards the end of her talk, if that's okay. Um, depending on the device you're using, you can find the chat button when you click on participants normally. After Barbara has spoken, I will try to gather up some of the questions and particularly the general themes of your questions and, and put them to Barbara and hopefully we'll have time for a, a few. Um, please note also that Barbara will not be able to comment comment on individual circumstances or specific cases. She'll only be able to address her answers in a very general way. And another reminder, um, remember that at Compassionate Friends, none of us are professionals. Um, we're, we're peer supporters. Um, and often, and that's what we offer, the, 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 the support of your peers, your fellow bereaved parents, not professionals. So, and often as um, for trauma, um, we have we need access to professional support. So just, just be aware of that, um, if you would, please. So we plan to finish our time together today at around 5.30 p.m. So now, after all the housekeeping, I'm absolutely delighted and actually thrilled to be able to welcome Dr. Barbara Douglas as our guest speaker today. Barbara, sadly, as you know, could I ask any, anyone who isn't mute to mute? Thanks. Um, Barbara, sadly, is a brief parent. Her eldest son, Andy, um, died suddenly in June 21, 2011 at just 29 years of age. In her professional life, Barbara is a, a chartered and registered counselling psychologist. She's the Associate Fellow of the British Psychological Society and a previous chair of the BPS Division of Counselling Psychology. She's received the British Psychological Society Professional Practice Boards, Practitioner of the Year Award, 
And for 15 years, Barbara worked as a clinical director of an eating disorders service before moving into academ the academic and training sectors. She's also co-authored the book, Common Presenting Issues in Psychotherapeutic Practice, and is lead editor for, that, for the Handbook of Counselling Psychology, which is the core training text for counselling psychologists. Thinking back personally, I'm sure I first met Barbara at a training and information day, actually, in Manchester for prospective and current TCF volunteers who wanted to start a support group for bereaved parents. That was in early 2017. Barbara did go on to set up a TCF support group after that day in, uh, in central Edinburgh, where she moved back to. Um, and this ran to, for many, for several years. Um, through the peer support and understanding Barbara fostered in the group and offered herself to others, she has helped very many bereaved parents in Edinburgh and the surrounding area. And fortunately, the Edinburgh group still runs and is facilitated by um, a, vol a wonderful volunteer, Jackie. And it was just last May, actually, when I attended the Scottish gathering in Stirling, which some of you may have been at, um, which is a wonderful retreat weekend for bereaved um, bereaved parents, siblings and grandparents. On the Saturday morning during this gathering, Barbara gave um, a, a version of the talk that you're going to hear today. And I was fortunate enough to be able to listen and immediately wanted to bring her insights to a wider audience. Her words struck a chord with me and I believe the whole audience at the gathering too. Um, as I, as I recall the debilitating and alarming changes in myself and symptoms that I experienced in the months and years after the death of my own daughter. These included flashbacks, anxiety, the inability to organize everything, anything. I couldn't make the smallest of decisions, was often totally exhausted, experienced panic attacks and could actually see little meaning or purpose in life. Um, and experienced a maelstrom of other emotions as well over the months and years after her loss. So when some years later I read and heard more about trauma, I came to an understanding that these symptoms were normal, from normal, normal symptoms in our very abnormal situation. And looking back, I now know I wasn't going crazy, although I felt like I was at the time. And I really wish I had known more about trauma and bereaved parents in the year, early years after my daughter's loss. So I'm really, really delighted that Barbara has agreed to talk to us today about just this subject. Barbara will be discussing some thoughts and feelings around the trauma we experience after the loss of our child or loved one. And she'll also be sharing with us some of the tra trauma she um, experienced after her son's death and some ideas about how we might find ways to manage um, these symptoms of the trauma. So thank you, Barbara, for being with us today. And I'm, I'm really delighted that you're gonna speak, uh, speak to us now. Are you there, Barbara? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's just go back to the. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Um, and uh, lovely that so many people have felt able to come today. Um, we're going to focus on trauma, which is often hidden behind the notions of, sort of grief and um, bereavement. Um, people here today will be at all different stages of, of their um, loss and so it's uh, what I, I think what I want to start off by saying is that if there are things in this talk that are useful for you then that's great but equally if there are things that are not helpful for you then please just put them away. Um, I may be a psychologist, but I am a bereaved mum and I found my own way through um, the years, which at the beginning I didn't think I would. Um, so really just to acknowledge that everybody here is at a different point and 
what helps one may or may not help another. So take what you want from this talk. But what is trauma? Um, I googled trauma, just a quick, quick Google, and what it brought up is a deeply distressing or disturbing experience, emotional shock following a stressful event, which may lead to long-term difficulties. But what particularly resonated with me was underneath the definition was synonyms, words that similarly describe the experiences of, of trauma. And I'm sure that many of you will recognize these as I did. Torment, agony, suffering, pain, anguish, misery, distress, heartbreak, wretchedness, woe, hell, purgatory. They all seem very apt um, descriptions for what we experience following the, the deaths of our, our children or our siblings or our grandchildren. So just to put um, trauma into context, trauma has always been around ever since, since, ever since people have been around, but it hasn't actually been a thing until more recently. Uh, there are intimations of it, um, experiences of it, for example, in Charles Dickens, when he was involved in a terrible um, train accident in 1865, when carriages fell off a bridge and he went to rescue people and tend the injured and the dying. And the description of his experiences afterwards is profound. But it wasn't really until World War I when uh, the notion of, of trauma began to evolve into something called shell shock at the First World War, when so many of the servicemen would come back with um, experiences, terrible experiences of shell shock. But it wasn't, it wasn't played up, it was played down uh, largely for political and economic reasons, because um, you know, it would have involved so many pension provision requirements at the time. So it was later on in the 20th century, after the Vietnam War, when the term post-traumatic stress disorder really came into being. The Veterans Association in America, um, those who had come back from Vietnam experiencing trauma symptoms, uh, couldn't get any help or treatment or therapy because in America everything was funded by insurance companies. So unless something had a diagnostic label as a disorder, there was no help available. So the Veterans Association really were um, um, very much at the, the heart of um, the, 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 the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. So thereafter, it has been in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, and that's the, the American book that describes all the um, psychiatric disorders, including post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's a very brief potted history of the notion of um, trauma. So let's uh, go to the next slide. So there's, there's various different ways of understanding trauma. There's this, that psychiatric one as a disorder. There's others that psychological ones that look at the um, emotional processing, the cognitive processing, a uh, uh, sort of neurological one that might look at the brain and how we process information and memories. Then there's artists who will depict their traumas in, um, in an artistic medium. And um, novelists like, um, like, like Dickens who, who portray it through writing. Now for me, uh, pictures paint a thousand words. Um, but as I said in Sterling, I am absolutely no artist. So um, I have gone to pictures that represent my experiences of um, trauma. But first of all, in a nutshell, what um, the theory of shattered assumptions says 
and this sort of underlies my experiences of trauma. Um, is that we make sense of our life based on assumptions about the world, ourselves and others. And that when something terrible, a trauma happens to us, suddenly all these assumptions are just shattered. Everything that we based our safety in the world on has gone. So this assumptive world just shatters. So what can that feel like? For me, this, this, this um, photo says it all. This picture says it all. My world shattered on the day the police came to the door to tell me that Andy had died. So all the assumptions that I had about the world being a relatively okay place where things were logical, logical things happened, there was a reason for events, and then suddenly all that safety just went. Nothing made sense anymore. And that just depicted it instantly for me. Similarly, this um, photo, which is a very clever photographer who's managed to capture the moment a bubble bursts. And again, this just sums up how that moment of trauma was for me when the police came to the door that morning. And I'm sure that you will all have your own ways of um, describing how, how things feel for you. Uh, you may not at the beginning because everything is so utterly, utterly confusing. But I found it helpful to me to try and make sense of, of what was happening to me in that confusion. So then there were the early days and the, the disbelief, the horror of those early days is sort of represented in Edvard Munch's The Scream. You know, the utter horror on the face of the, the individual in the painting. The flaming red skies, sort of horrific in the background, danger, and the dark background of the sea behind it, with the broken figure behind leaning over the fence but far away. So that, that um, painting just resonated with my early days feelings. What helped at that point? Well, I found a book and I'm not saying go out and buy this book um, because everybody's different. I just happened to find this one. And it's an edited book of um, nine women who have lost their child and all their different experiences. And I just found that so, uh, it offered me a strange sort of comfort in the early days when I felt so utterly, utterly alone, um, that, that here there were other people on this alien planet I found myself on who were also there too. Then came a point of trying to move back into the world that I had been in before Andy died. How on earth do we do that? Um, I needed to earn an income. I couldn't, I couldn't stop. Um, how was I going to go out into the world when everything I did uh, launched me into a panic attack? Um, or to seeing a police car going down the road would, would send me back into the, um, the, the, a flashback of, of the day the police came to the door. So this, this painting here, just represents that inner terror um, after the shattering of all my assumptions about the world. Um, going on a train, doing a training course, um, going to a committee, all things that I had done fairly, fairly happily beforehand now became totally different and produced fear at every level. And one of the things that helped at that point was the compassionate friends. 
Um, I wasn't able to go to a group in the early days for other circumstances, practical circumstances in my life. Um, but a colleague who emailed me um, with the, the name of the Compassionate Friends, and I'll be forever grateful to her for doing that, because again in there, the regional contact made contact with me and would just check in with me fairly regularly. And again, it gave me the solace in a way of feeling less alone. Now, you might wonder why on earth is there a picture of a, a woman painting a wall um, in a talk about trauma? But I guess that during these early times, the only thing that really helped me was things that calmed me, that calmed all the terror and anxiety and disbelief and horror. And I found that painting did. Just the soporific movement of a paintbrush on a wall it's a kind of mindful activity, I guess. Um, and, and so things that calmed me were, were what I, I tried to find at that point. Not consciously, um, I sort of stumbled across them all. So let's look at um, this. this. This is a slide by um, Margaret Brearley, who is a long-term member of um, the Compassionate Friends and also a trustee. And she has given me permission to use her, her, um, her notes here. And I think what she says at the beginning is absolutely paramount, that common symptoms of PTSD, which seem deeply abnormal, are in fact normal reactions to profound trauma. And they can include flashbacks, memory loss, repetitive actions, feelings of intense loneliness, feelings of being disconnected from everyone and everything, feeling that everything is unreal, feeling that life is empty and meaningless and wanting to die, apathy and self-neglect, thinking that one is going mad, changes in appetite, numbness, the inability to feel or to cry, despair, feeling shocked, uncontrollable changes of mood, endless what ifs and if onlys, dread on waking, experiencing agoraphobia, finding it hard to care about other people, recklessness, insomnia, physical pain in the heart or the stomach, um, and broken heartedness, and sometimes physical cardiac problems. I guess that probably many of you here will recognize a whole load of those feelings. And um, the, the, the one that um, I get stuck on in a way is the endless what ifs and if onlys. And in terms of the earlier slide of the theory of shattered assumptions, what that says is that if our assumptions are shattered, we are, as people, programmed to try and make sense of a co completely confusing, illogical world that we now find ourselves in. And one of the ways that sadly we do that is to look into ourselves almost. If only I had phoned him that night. If only I had done that. If only I had been somewhere else. If only I had been a better mum. And in a way, we're trying to make sense of the nonsensical. Um, so I'm sure that many of you will recognize some of these. And let's look at some of them in particular here. Flashbacks. Um, flashbacks will be different for everybody. They tend to involve us feeling that the event is, um, that we are reliving the event again in the present or that we have one foot in the past and one foot in the present. Um, for me, the flashback is triggered again when a police car goes past my house. But for other people, it will be different things. 
Um, for clients I've seen, for example, I've had um, clients who experience a door banging will trigger a flashback or a particular wind on a warm day or something like that. It can be anything that may be um, related to the original trauma that will trigger it. And that's scary because when it happens, we feel so out of control, not knowing where we're at and feeling like we are going mad. And one of the things that we can try and do to help cope with a flashback is the 54321 exercise. And we can also use this for panic attacks and anxiety. It's not a miracle cure by any means, and it won't ever bring back the thing we most want, but it does somehow help us to think we have something, some tool to use that can help give us a wee bit of confidence that we, we actually have some, um, something that we can do. And it's about trying to focus on the here and now, on the right now in a very concrete way which disrupts the, um, the panic attack feelings and the physical adrenaline system that is, is um, causing a lot of the feelings. So you can say to yourself, what five things can I see? For example, I can see my uh, laptop, I can see my glass of water. What four things can I hear? For example, I can hear a car, I can hear my clock ticking. What three things can I feel or touch? I can feel the table. I can feel my clothes. What two things can I smell or like the smell of? I can smell coffee and I like the smell of roses. And then take one slow, deep breath. So in through your nose and out through your mouth. And you can repeat that as often as is helpful to you um, and wherever you are. Another tool is mindful breathing. And again, it's no magic answer, but what it does do is to interrupt the anxiety cycle that triggers off all the um, uh, hormonal systems that activate all the feelings of fight or flight, which is really what the trauma is um, about. It, our, our whole physical activation as well as our psychological activation. There's a, a bunch of um, breathing exercises you can do and there's one on here. And you will have access to these slides afterwards, so don't worry about trying to write it down or anything like that. Equally, if you go online, you will find other ones. I find that um, one I like, and I used to use it going on planes, which I hated, um, and it was very helpful. And it, that is to count to 10 very slowly through your nose and out through your mouth and then from 10 back to one again. And it, it really helped to calm me. And the research does, does indicate too, you know, that, it, that the effect it has on the stress systems um, is similar to taking an anti-anxiety drug, but without the side effects. And the more you practice that one, the easier it becomes to do it anywhere any time. But again, for some people it's helpful, for other people just the very action of sitting quietly may trigger things and maybe it's not the right time for you. So again, take from this what is helpful, experiment with it if you want, but um, don't take it as this is something that everybody finds helpful. Margaret also um, talked about the cognitive functions um, and the, the brain fog and the confusion that we feel at, um, after we lose our children. This took me by surprise. 
um, at one point I really thought I had early onset dementia um, and was pretty worried about that too. And I think what we don't recognize often is that the cognitive side effects of grief and trauma are huge. And they do make us feel that we're going mad or crazy, but we're not. It's like we have goggles of trauma on and somehow everything out there has to be filtered through these goggles. Why wouldn't we be confused? It's normal. And I found this poem written by Gina Clay, who's another long-term member of um, TCF, quite helpful in normalizing the experience in a fairly light-hearted way. So, no, my mind isn't on the job at hand, I freely admit it, and frequently I find myself, well, not where I should be at all. I've just not been sleeping, so I set off to get a prescription, but instead of going to the doctors, the car went to Tesco's. So I bought the milk I forgot yesterday. I thought I sorted out probate, but there's yet more legal stuff to cope with. Well, forget the solicitors, the car went to Tesco's. Wish I hadn't forgotten my, uh, my mobile. Tomorrow it's the dentist. I've been putting it off since last August. I know I'll be shaking with fright, but with any luck and despite my very best intentions, the car will end up in Tesco's. So although fairly light-hearted um, kind of poem, it, it, it helped me just to normalize some of the experiences. I am not going mad or crazy. Margaret also talked about the sense of desolation, the sense of distance from others and from everything. And for me, this, this um, picture just represents that so well. This figure in this dark grey kind of vacuum kind of uh, context, standing there alone, but with foggy um, people in the background, far away. So what helped me to deal with some of all these feelings and experiences um, going forward? Well, I had counselling um, during the first year after Andy's death on the NHS. Um, and I know it is difficult to access that. Um, uh, and it, uh, it's such a shame that it is. I think I was lucky in being able to access it and having a wonderful counsellor who again, couldn't fix it, of course, because nothing could, but he was able to listen. He was genuinely interested. He, he wanted to hear about Andy's life as well as his death and how I felt. And so again, I would come out of these sessions feeling calmer than I had gone in. And I think in that first year, it was things that helped me feel calmer, that helped. This slide is a slide about counselling and, oops, wait a minute, go back, there we go. Um, yeah, at the bottom is the link to the British Association of Counselling and Psychotherapy. And if you are interested in finding counselling for yourself outside of the NHS, you can go on this website and search a geographical list um, of therapists in your area that will also say what their areas of specialism are. Sometimes people will have employee assistance programs through work or health insurance through work or privately. Um, so it may be that there are other ways of accessing um, counselling for you, as well as the voluntary agencies. But again, what I would say to everyone is that if it feels right for you, it probably is. If it doesn't, then it may not be. I, when I moved house, I went to a different counsellor and he wanted to interpret all my feelings. He clearly had a very different kind of training. 
and it was just no use to me whatsoever. So I didn't I didn't go back. Um, but it's finding what what helps you. So to go back to post-traumatic stress disorder, which tends to be the psychiatric label, um, whether you think of this as a disorder or as a disordered situation in which our reactions are normal, I think this slide shows a lot of the words that, again, we probably all experience after the, the, the terrible loss of our children, siblings and grandchildren. Phobia, stress, death, flashback, nightmare, um, amnesia, numbing, disturbing, arousal, threat, all these kind of words that are involved in post-traumatic stress disorder. So in a psychiatric kind of language, if you are um, seeking help, um, and are maybe referred to a psychiatrist, possibly some psychologists as well, um, they, there may be emphasis on diagnosis and the, the DSM-5 um, has all the criteria for PTSD and all other disorders. Um, and so these are the criteria that people need to meet in order to be diagnosed with PTSD. That, that um, handout came from um, the, the, this link here. And it's only one of many where you can find the criteria for PTSD. I, I just um, thought it was helpful to put the link I'd found up. You can also buy the DSM, but I really probably wouldn't recommend it as a good read. Um, and behind the criteria, um, if we take um, in more depth criterion A, for example, um, behind it are these experiences that people are, um, um, uh, that, that, that they uh, need to meet in order to be um, deemed to meet the criteria for that, that uh, for that criteria. And one word of slight caution here is that when we seek help, we often desperately need to hope that somebody has the answers. And professionals will have lots of expertise in various areas but they're also human and some will know more than others. So for example, some people may know this first bit, the person was exposed to death, threatened death, direct exposure. And sometimes it can be tricky to get help because they're not necessarily focusing on the indirectly by learning that a close relative or friend was exposed to trauma. So I guess why I'm saying this is because I think it's helpful to have some information um, to take with you if you're seeking help, to have a wee bit of knowledge around it. It helps you and it may also help the professional to access the right kind of support for you. So psychologists often um, look at trauma and the brain and the way we process information. So if you think about the, the, the again, the photo of the, the bubble bursting, how we take that in is very different from if I was describing to you in words how a bubble bursts. And that's because we process information in different pathways in the brain we have an emotional or sensory processing pathway and a cognitive processing pathway. And what happens with a traumatic event means that because it's so, it, we, it, it impacts on us in the moment um, that it lodges in the emotional sensory brain rather than being 
activating the cognitive pathway, which hasn't time to catch up. As a result, the emotional sensory brain pathway goes round and round again, and it's the event is kind of stuck in there, which is why we get triggered by things like a police car coming past the house. It triggers that again. So our subsequent ability to process the cognitive aspects, which can help to reduce the flashbacks, isn't available to us. So, and because the process is so unpleasant, we become hypervigilant to threat and try and avoid it at all costs. Um, I still can't go back to the place where Andy died. Um, and there may be others of you who will have places that, or, or events, or that you, 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 you just can't go near. So this slide is just a, um, a, a diagram of the, the um, brain pathway where um, trauma impacts. I wonder how many of you have heard of or have experienced um, what's called EMDR, eye movement desensitizing and reprocessing therapy. This is an evidence-based therapy for trauma um, that actually can help to um, decrease the intensity of the flashbacks and it's a strange one at first. I'm not, a, I'm not an EMDR therapist and I haven't had EMDR. It'd be interesting maybe if other people have. Um, but it, it struck me as how can something that involves following the finger of a therapist with rapid eye movements, how on earth can it help to deal with trauma? But while you're focusing on the trauma and doing that, what you're actually doing is mirroring what happens when we're asleep at night. Sleep is in different stages and one of the stages of sleep is called rapid eye movement sleep. And that's the point of the night in which we dream and we're processing the events and experiences of the, the day or the week. So EMDR, in fact, actually makes some sense in that way. It's mirroring a naturally occurring experience. And so it helps us to put a cognitive um, experience around and so lower the emotional intensity of the flashback. You can find out more about EMDR um, at that link there, the EMDR Institute, if you're interested. It is a um, evidence-based therapy that's recommended by NICE, the National Institute for um, Health and Clinical Excellence. Um, so it can be obtained on the NHS. But again, it's quite hard sometimes. GPs, others may be focusing on the grief and the normal process rather than on trauma. So again, if you have some information, it can help input to the kind of referral you might get. Trauma-focused CBT is another evidence-based therapy, and it, it works on the same principle of the, the, um, the, 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 the pathways of the brain. But what this does is to try over a number of sessions with the therapist to actually put in the context of the event. So for example, um, in, in, in the one that I, when I lost Andy and, and the police came and that was the, the trauma moment for me, it would start by focusing on, well, maybe what was happening first thing in the morning? What did I have for breakfast? Um, you know, it, it would go very gradually putting a context around the trauma, focusing on the trauma, and then building the context afterwards as well. And it's not again about removing trauma altogether, it's about decreasing the intensity and experiences of the flashbacks 
and building that um, cognitive narrative, if you like, around it, which helps to make some sense of things. Um, okay, so talked about informed support seeking as being helpful. So this slide has three um, places where you can read up on trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, NHS Scotland, NHS Choices, and NICE, the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. So sometimes if you're seeking help, accessing some of these um, materials, which are freely available, can be helpful in helping the other person to help you best. So back to imagery. I wonder how many of you recognize the feelings in this one. Go ahead, tell me. Tell me I need to move on again, I dare you. I think probably a lot of people here will have experienced this in various forms of people who thankfully for them have not had to experience the loss of their child, grandchild or sibling. And um, I remember being told at one point fairly early on, you can't live in the past forever. And there's so many variations on that that can feel like being stabbed in the heart. And I think it's as well as um, it's the, the, you know, people, I guess it's very hard for other people to fully understand what it's like to lose a child. But equally, I think it's very hard for other people and ourselves to actually understand the trauma that we're experiencing too. And that this is um, very often needing help and attention as well. So going forward in my own um, life following um, the loss of Andy, what helps me? Well, now I can say that Andy, I feel Andy safely in my heart. My heart is broken, yes, um, but Andy is now safe within there and I take him forward along with me and I need to look after myself in that too. Sometimes that's easier than others. And I guess at the beginning, particularly, it's terribly hard because I think the feelings around, you know, why should I still be here when my child is not here, it's not right, or all the if onlys and the self-blame um, make it very hard to care for oneself. So it can feel wobbly, like a wobbly ladder, um, but I now feel I can most of the time, um, look after myself um, in, in the situation I find myself in. Sometimes, of course, it's harder than others. And finally, I think this, this slide just describes, just represents maybe where I feel I am at after 11 years. And yes, my world is shattered. It will always be shattered. I will always you know, want Andy back here, although he is safely in my heart. But Andy and I can grow in this shattered world. And I'm not saying this in an idealistic way. Sometimes this is, this is fine and other times it isn't. But overall, yes, there is hope and light um, at 11 years. Uh, but having just said that, I would also say that hope was a word that at the beginning I hated because how could I possibly hope and I didn't want to. Um, so thank you for listening and um, I hope that you will take away from this some self-care for yourselves afterwards too because I don't know what this has triggered for you. Um, and 
if you've taken something from it that's of help for you, that's great. But equally, don't feel you have to take it all. Thank you. And back to you, Carolyn. Thank, thank you very much, Barbara. And that's exactly the words that I was going to use as well to say that I hope that um, um, everyone listening here has been able to find something of, um, that's been a bit helpful. Um, to, and, uh, and if you haven't, then, you know, that, that's fine too. That's, that's, that's fine too. But I just wonder if anyone has any uh, questions. We've got a few minutes now. Um, so some questions for um, Barbara or comments. Um, so there's a question here about Barbara for about um, experience. Did you ever experience struggles in your relationship as a result of your trauma? Um, so that kind of difference between um, uh, in different people's reactions, maybe our partner or other members of family. Um, and our sort of approach, different mm. approaches, and any advice for or suggestions around managing those different um, approaches? Yes, um, the, the, the short answer is yes. Um, in, in various relationships, I've experienced difficulties around that. Um, people get it wrong regularly, um, and some people get it right. Um, but in the what I found was that in the early days, people getting it wrong really did feel like being stabbed in the back or in the heart um, because it almost said things about Andy or about me or about I should just be able to get on with things or whatever it was about. Um, and, and it... <laughs> I think what I did was decide when these things happened, who I was going to talk to and who I wasn't going to talk to. Friends that became closer friends as a result and others that became um, um, perhaps more on a continuum towards acquaintances than, than formerly had been. Um, there was there was one one friend, for example, who said to me um, at one point, "Oh, it's good to see you back to your old self again." Um, I wanted to smack her about the face. Um, it, it hurt. I, I was never going to be who I had been before, but she wasn't. I had choices at that point. I could either say, "Look, let's." T this is not okay for me and talk about it with her or I could just put her back towards the acquaintance level. Um, I think it's different for um, different, different people have different relationships and um, people with partners. Um, sometimes I could get envious of people with partners, but at other times I thought, thank God I don't have a partner here too, um, because I hear so much about people that are at different points and grieving in different ways that it's difficult. So, um, yeah, I think what I found though is that sometimes just letting it go has been helpful because as I've gone on, it hasn't hurt so much. I just make a decision about who I share things with. But certainly in the early days, it was like being stabbed in the heart. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so I'm trying to collect up the questions, if that's okay. So I'll try to ask them around themes, but um, uh, there's a question here about um, sort of thanking you for mentioning about hope and how difficult that word can mm. be mm. early on. Um, it feels too positive, I guess. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, some thanks for, for sort of mentioning that. But um, you talked at the end about having Andy um, tuck safe in your heart. Yeah. And there's a question about, did you feel that you did anything consciously to get to that? that space after 11 years 
No, I, I, I don't feel I did it consciously. I muddled my way through, like I think probably most of us do. Um, but it just sort of happened. And it began to happen about three years for me. And that's not saying that that's when it happens for other people or in the same way at all. That's just my experience. And what I began to notice then was that whereas before I had been so intent on going to his grave as often and, and all the time I could, gradually that seemed to feel less important because not, not because I was moving away from him or letting go, which is another phrase I hate, um, but because he felt he was safe within me and that feeling has increased over time. Um, so I think my feeling is that when people say things like, oh, you have to move on or you have to let go, it's just, it's meaningless in my view. So no, I didn't do anything consciously, um, but I was aware of it happening mm. and it was comforting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, there's a few comments that we, we need to end soon, but just a few comments about you know some of the things that you mentioned about the what ifs that torture that can torture us, and the feeling that you know um, that life's become kind of meaningless. Mm. Um, what 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 do you? Um, do you think those things just eventually dissipate or are there things that we can do or um, I don't know how do you get over that, that rumination about what if and what's the point and yeah I um I, I find that the rumination might come back in moments of stress or might come back for example, this year, the anniversary was on the same day of the week as when Andy died. So that seemed to trigger more reliving. Um, but knowing that I know this will ease again, it's like we have to learn to be on this alien planet in order to know how to live with it somehow. Um, and that just comes with time, I guess. Um, oh, I've lost my thread here. What was it? Yeah. Um, what were they? Oh, the, yeah, they, their phone leaves and things. Just dealing with the what is. Yeah. And the phone. other thing that I found really helpful was that book, Shattered Assumptions, because it made sense of why I was doing it. Even if I didn't believe it was about shattered assumptions, but did believe it was my fault, it helped me to read about this, that um, we are programmed to try and make sense of the world in, in, a, um, in a logical way. So I guess blaming ourselves, somebody else, is, is also ways of trying to make sense of something. So it helped me a bit to read that book and just think, okay, okay, I know what I'm doing again. Um, mm. It doesn't necessarily make it less painful in the moment, but I, just by making sense of something, it helps me. Mm. Mm. Thank you. And just, just finally, um, there's some questions about, you know, accessing professional support, how, um, how um, helpful, um, you know, what can you say to your GP or, or other um, people to try and access um, mm -hmm. uh, support? Um, well, them? I think what I've tried to say in this um, talk and given the links for things for is that in a way, find out the information in advance so that if you get met by things like 
well, grief is a normal process. We can't access counselling for you yet. Um, you have got more information about trauma, for example. Um, or you can um, you can even print off like Mar Margaret Brearley's um, list of um, symptoms of PTSD and take it to a GP. And just because some GPs will know more than others. And there is a tendency as a bottom line to think it's just a normal process, therefore the NHS can't provide help. Here's a list of voluntary organisations. And the organisations themselves may be helpful, but again, if you find that something feels right, it's probably right for you. If it doesn't, it probably isn't. I know that accessing help is hard. And that's where I think informed help seeking can at least help a little bit. Okay, thank you, thank you. We do need to end. I'm sorry we haven't got to everybody's questions, um, but um, I just wanted to thank um, Barbara um, uh, and also uh, for her really very informative actually, um, um, helpful I hope and, and hopeful words for us. I think for myself, as I said at the beginning, it's really helpful to to understand some of the theory of what what's going on um, uh, with this profound loss, um, so that we can sort of understand our reactions and, and how we're behaving, and that we're not crazy. We're just, it's just they're just normal reactions yes. to to this very um, abnormal. Um, situation that we find ourselves in um, so sort of understanding the theory and, and also our, our sort of having uh, linking that with our sort of lived experience um, after this profound loss I think is for me anyway was very it was very helpful um, so we really both of us um, and all of us at Compassionate Friends actually really hope that some of the reflections on on trauma and bereaved parents and, and child loss has resonated with you um, this afternoon and you found something today to take away and help you um, as you as you travel on in this, this kind of journey of loss. Um, so huge thanks to, to Barbara for taking the time um, to talk to us um, about her experiences and, and her insights and to answer questions and comments. And thank you to you all too um, for your, ins your really um, insightful questions and your contributions. And I'm, I'm really sorry that we haven't had time to, um, to get to them all, but um, I noticed that in the chat, people are saying that what you have all written is very supportive of each other and, and helpful for each other, which is what Compassionate Friends is all about. So I, I'm really glad to see that, that you, you're taking something from, from each other's um, experience and, and, and ideas too. So please remember um, that the details of all Compassionate Friends support, and remember that is peer support, we are not professionals, is on our website at www.tcf.org.uk. And all the, uh, this talk and Barbara's slides will be up on our website um, in the next few days under um, support videos, if you look underneath there, and you'll find all the recordings of all, I think we've done about 10 now, different um, parents and, and siblings talking about and reflecting on their own loss um, with their unique perspective. So um, you can have a look at those. And sometimes they're really, helpful I find uh, if you're having a bad day just to listen to a, a talk um, uh, which can be really helpful in kind of you know helping us to to uh, ways thinking about ways to cope um, so just yeah just sometimes just listening to how others have coped um, can be helpful for navigating our own pain and and really, ultimately, to know that we're not alone with these, um, these feelings and thoughts. And remember that our helpline, if you wanted to speak um, with another bereaved parent, our helpline is open 365 days a year, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and 7 to 10 p.m. at night. 
and you can, you know, if you, they're there to listen, our volunteers are all brief parents themselves and they're there to listen and um, uh, with empathy and offer support. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for being with us today. And we hope to see you um, again very soon at uh, either in an online event or even at an in-person event now. So stay well and be safe and um, lots of love from all of us at Compassionate Friends. And uh, yeah, thank you for being with us and thank you, Barbara. So please just leave the room, uh, the Zoom room whenever you um, wish to.